Prefatory Note and Dedication of the Ballad of the White Horse This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton Prefatory Note This ballad needs no historical notes, for the simple reason that it does not profess to be historical. All of it that is not frankly fictitious, as in any prose romance about the past, is meant to emphasize tradition rather than history. King Alfred is not a legend in the sense that King Arthur may be a legend, that is, in the sense that he may possibly be a lie, but King Alfred is a legend in this broader and more human sense that the legends are the most important thing about him. The cult of Alfred was a popular cult from the darkness of the ninth century to the deepening twilight of the twentieth. It is wholly as a popular legend that I deal with him here. I write as one ignorant of everything except that I have found the legend of a king of Wessex still alive in the land. I will give three curt cases of what I mean. A tradition connects the ultimate victory of Alfred with the valley in Berkshire called the Vale of the White Horse. I have seen doubts of the tradition which may be valid doubts. I do not know when or where the story started. It is enough that it started somewhere and ended with me, for I only seek to write upon a heresy, as the old balladists did. For the third case there is a popular tale that Alfred came in contact with a woman and Kate. I select it because it is a popular tale, because it is a vulgar one. It has been disputed by grave historians who were, I think, a little too grave to be good judges of it. The two chief charges against the story are that it was first recorded long after Alfred's death and that, as Mr. Oman urges, Alfred never really wandered all alone without any thanes or soldiers. Both these objections might possibly be met. It has taken us nearly as long to learn the whole truth about Byron, and perhaps longer to learn the whole truth about Pepys than elapsed between Alfred and the first writing of such tales. And as for the other objection, do the historians really think that Alfred after Wilton, or Napoleon after Lipsick, never walked around about in a wood by himself for the matter of an hour or two. Ten minutes might be made sufficient for the essence of the story, but I am not concerned to prove the truth of these popular traditions. It is enough for me to maintain two things, that they are popular traditions, and that without these popular traditions we should have bothered about Alfred about as much as we bother about Edwig. One other consideration needs a note. Alfred has come down to us in the best way, that is, by national legends, solely for the same reason as Arthur and Roland, and the other giants of that darkness, because he fought for the Christian civilization against the heathen nihilism. But since this work was really done by generation after generation by the Romans, before they withdrew, and by the Britons while they remained, I have surmised this first crusade in a triple symbol and given to a fictitious Roman, Celt, and Saxon, a part in the glory of Ethendon. I fancy that in fact Alfred's Wessex was a very mixed bloods, but in any case it is the chief value of legend to mix up the centuries, while preserving the sentiment, to see all ages in a sort of splendid foreshortening. That is the use of tradition, a telescope's history. G. K. C. Dedication Of great limbs gone to chaos, a great face turned to night, why bend above a shapeless shroud, seeking, in such archaic cloud, sight of strong lords and light? Where seven sunken Englands lie buried one by one, why should one idol spade, I wonder, shake up the dust of thanes like thunder, to smoke and choke the sun? In cloud of clay so cast to heaven, what shape shall men discern? These lords may light the mystery of mastery or victory, and these ride high in history, but these shall not return. Gored on the Norman gonfalon, the golden dragon died. We shall not wake with ballad strings, the good time of the smaller things. We shall not see the holy kings ride down by Severin's side. Stiff, strange, and quaintly colored, as the broidery of Bayou. The England of that dawn remains, and this of Alfred and the Danes, seems like the tales of a whole tribe veins too English to be true of a good king on an island that ruled once in a time, and as he walked by an apple-tree there came green devils out of the sea with sea-plants trailing heavily and tracks of opal slime. 
Yet Alfred is no fairy tale, his days as our days ran. He also looked forth for an hour on peopled plains and skies that lower from those few windows in the tower that is the head of a man. But who shall look from Alfred's hood or breathe his breath alive? His sentry, like a small dark cloud, drifts far. It is an eyeless crowd, where the tortured trumpets scream aloud and the dense arrows drive. Lady, by one light only, we look from Alfred's eyes. We know we saw athwart the wreck the sign that hangs about your neck, where one more than Meltdeck is dead and never dies. Therefore I bring these rhymes to you who brought the cross to me, since on you flaming without flaw I saw the sign that Guthrum saw, when he let break his ships of awe and laid peace on the sea. Do you remember when we went under a dragon moon, and mid volcanic tints of night walked where they fought the unknown fight, and saw black trees on the battle height, black thorn on Ethendune? And I thought I will go with you, as man with God has gone, and wander with a wandering star, the wandering heart of things that are, the fiery cross of love and war that like yourself goes on. O go you onward where you are, shall honour and laughter be, past purpled forest and pearled foam, God's winged pavilion free to roam, your face that is a wandering home, a flying home for me. Ride through the silent earthquake lands, wide as a waste is wide, across these days like deserts, when pride and a little scratching pen have dried and split the hearts of men, heart of the heroes ride. Up through an empty house of stars, being what heart you are, up the inhuman steeps of space, as on a staircase go in grace, carrying the firelight on your face beyond the loneliest star. Take these, in memory of the hour we strayed a space from home, and saw the smoke-hued hamlets, quaint with Westland king and Westland saint, and watched the western glory faint along the road to Frome. End of Prefatory Note and Dedication Recording by Gail Cato Book One of the Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, The Vision of the King. Before the gods that made the gods had seen their sunrise pass, the white horse of the white horse vale was cut out of the grass. Before the gods that made the gods had drunk at dawn their fill, the white horse of the white horse vale was hoary on the hill. Age beyond age on British land, aeons and aeons gone, was peace and war in the western hills, and the white horse looked on. For the white horse knew England when there was none to know. He saw the first oar break or bend, he saw heaven fall, and the world end. Oh God, how long ago! For the end of the world was long ago, and all we dwell today, as children of some second birth, like a strange people left on earth after a judgment day. For the end of the world was long ago, when the ends of the world waxed free, when Rome was sunk in a waste of slaves and the sun drowned in the sea, when Caesar's sun fell out of the sky, and who so hearkened right could only hear the plunging of the nations in the night, when the ends of the earth came marching in to torch and crescent gleam, and the roads of the world that lead to Rome were filled with faces that moved like foam, like faces in a dream. And men rode out of the eastern lands, broad river and burning plain, trees that are titan flowers to see, and tiger skies striped horribly with tints of tropic rain. Where Ein's enameled peaks arise around that inmost one, where ancient eagles on its brink Vast as archangels gather and drink the sacrament of the sun, and men break out of the northern lands, enormous lands alone, where spell is laid upon life and lust, and the rain is changed to a silver dust, and the sea to a great green stone, and a shape that moveth murkily in mirrors of ice and night, 
hath blanched with fear all beasts and birds, as death and a shock of evil words blast a man's hair white. And the cry of the poems and the purple moons, or the cry of the frost and foam, swept ever around an inmost place, and the din of distant race on race cried and replied round Rome. And there was death upon the emperor, and night upon the pope, and Alfred, hiding in the deep grass, hardened his heart with hope. A sea-folk, blinder than the sea, broke all about his land, but Alfred up against them bare, and gripped the ground, and grasped the air, staggered and strove to stand. He bent them back with spear and spade, with desperate dyke and wall, with foemen leaning on his shield, and roaring on him when he reeled, and no help came at all. He broke them with a broken sword, a little towards the sea, and for one hour of panting peace, ringed with a roar that would not cease, with golden crown and girded fleece, made laws under a tree. The Northmen came about our land, a Christless chivalry, who knew not of the arch or pen, great, beautiful, half-witted men, from the sunrise and the sea. Misshapen ships stood on the deep, full of strange gold and fire, and hairy men, as huge as sin, with horned heads came wading in through the long, low sea-mire. Our towns were shaken of tall kings, with scarlet beards like blood. The world turned empty where they trod. They took the kindly cross of God, and cut it up for wood. Their souls were drifting as the sea, and all good towns and lands. They only saw with heavy eyes, and broke with heavy hands. Their gods were sadder than the sea, gods of a wandering will, who cried for blood like beasts at night, sadly from hill to hill. They seemed as trees walking the earth, as witless and as tall, yet they took hold upon the heavens, and no help came at all. They bred like birds in English woods, they rooted like the rose, when Alfred came to Atelney to hide him from their bows. There was not English armor left, nor any English thing, when Alfred came to Atelney to be an English king. For earthquake swallowing earthquake uprent the Wessex tree, the whirlpool of the pagan sway had swirled his sires as sticks away when a flood smites the sea. And the great kings of Wessex, wearied and sank in gore, and even their ghosts in that great stress grew grayer and grayer, less and less, with the lords that died in lioness, and the king that comes no more. And the god of the golden dragon was dumb upon his throne, and the lord of the golden dragon ran in the woods alone, and if he ever climbed the crest of luck, and set the flag before, returning as a wheel returns, came ruin and the rain that burns, and all began once more. And naught was left King Alfred, but shameful tears of rage, in the island, in the river, in the end of all his age. In the island, in the river, he was broken to his knee, and he read, writ with an iron pen, that God had wearied of Wessex men, and given their country field and fen to the devils of the sea. And he saw in a little picture, tiny and far away, his mother sitting in Edbert's hall, and a book she showed him very small, where Sapphire Mary sat in stall, with a golden Christ at play. It was wrought in the monk's low manner, from silver and sanguine shell, where the scenes are little and terrible, keyholes of heaven and hell. In the river island of Atelney, with the river running past, in colours of such simple creed, all things sprang at him, sun and weed, till the grass grew to be grass indeed, and the tree was a tree at last. Fearfully plain the flowers grew, like the child's book to read, or like a friend's face seen in a glass. He looked, and there our lady was. She stood and stroked the tall live grass as a man strokes his steed. Her face was like an open word, when brave men speak and choose. The very colours of her coat were better than good news. She spoke not, nor turned not, nor any sign she cast. Only she stood up straight and free, between the flowers in Atelney and the river running past. One dim ancestral jewel hung 
on his ruined armor gray. He rent and cast it at her feet, where, after centuries with slow feet, men came from hall and school and street, and found it where it lay. Mother of God, the wanderer said, I am but a common king, nor will I ask what saints may ask to see a secret thing. The gates of heaven are fearful gates, worse than the gates of hell. Not I would break the splendors barred, or seek to note the thing they guard, which is too good to tell. But for this earth most pitiful, this little land I know, if that which is for ever is, or if our heart shall break with bliss seeing the stranger go. When our last bow is broken, queen, and our last javelin cast, under some sad green evening sky, holding a ruined cross on high, under warm westland grass to lie, shall we come home at last? And a voice came, human, but high up, like a cottage climbed among the clouds, or a serf of hut and croft that sits by his hovel fire as oft, but hears on his old bare roof aloft a belfry burst in song. The gates of heaven are lightly locked, we do not guard our gain. The heaviest hind may easily come silently and suddenly upon me in a lane, and any little maid that walks in good thoughts apart may break the guard of the three kings and see the dear and dreadful things I hid within my heart. The meanest man in grave fields gone behind the set of sun heareth between star and other star through the door of darkness fallen ajar the counsel, eldest of things that are, the talk of three in one. The gates of heaven are lightly locked, we do not guard our gold. Men may uproot where worlds begin, or read the name of the nameless sin, but if he fail, or if he win, to no good man is told. The men of the east may spell the stars, and times and triumphs mark, but the men, signed of the cross of Christ, go gaily in the dark. The men of the east may search the scrolls for sure fates and fame, but the men that drink the blood of God go singing to their shame. The wise men know what wicked things are written on the sky. They trim sad lamps, they touch sad strings, hearing the heavy purple wings where the forgotten seraph kings still plot how God shall die. The wise men know all evil things, under the twisted trees, where the perverse in pleasure pine, and men are weary of green wine, and sick of crimson seas. But you and all the kind of Christ are ignorant and brave, and you have wars you hardly win, and souls you hardly save. I tell you not for your comfort, ye not for your desire, save that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Night shall be thrice night over you, and heaven an iron cope. Do you have joy without a cause, ye faith without a hope? Even as she spoke she was not, nor any words that he, he only heard, still as he stood, under the old knight's nodding hood, the sea-folk breaking down the wood, like a high tide from sea. He only heard the heathen men, whose eyes are blue and bleak, singing about some cruel thing done by a great and smiling king in daylight on a deck. He only heard the heathen men, whose eyes are blue and blind, singing what shameful things are done between the sunlit sea and the sun when the land is left behind. End of book one. Recording by Gail Cato. Book two of The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two. The Gathering of the Chiefs. Up across the windy wastes, and up went Alfred over the shores, shaken of the joy of giants, the joy without a cause. In the slopes away to the western bays, where blows not ever a tree, he washed his soul in the west wind, and his body in the sea, and he set to rhyme his ale measures, and he sang aloud his laws, because of the joy of the giants, the joy without a cause. The king went gathering Wessex men, as grain out of the chaff, the few that were alive to die, laughing as littered skulls that lie after lost battles turn to the sky an everlasting laugh. The king went gathering Christian men, as wheat out of the husk, Eldred 
the Franklin by the sea, and Mark the man from Italy, and Colin of the sacred tree from the old tribe on Usk. The rook croaked homeward heavily, the west was clear and warm, smoke of evening food and ease rose like a blue tree in the trees when he came to Eldred's farm. But Eldred's farm was fallen awry, like an old cripple's bones, and Eldred's tools were red with rust, and on his well was a green crust, and purple thistles upward thrust between the kitchen stones. But smoke of some good feasting went upwards evermore, and Eldred's door stood wide apart, for loitering foot or labouring cart, and Eldred's great and foolish heart stood open like his door. A mighty man was Eldred, a bulk for casks to fill. His face was a dreaming furnace, his body a walking hill. In the old wars of Wessex his sword had sunken deep, but all his friends, he signed and said, were broken about Ethelred, and between the deep drink and the dead he had fallen upon sleep. Come not to me, King Alfred, save always for the ale. Why should my harmless hinds be slain, because the chiefs cry once again, as in all fights that we shall gain, and in all fights we fail? Your scalds still thunder and prophesy that crown that never comes. Friend, I will watch the certain things, swine, and slow moons like silver rings, and the ripening of the plums. And Alfred answered, drinking, and gravely, without blame, nor bear I boast of scald or king, the thing I bear is a lesser thing, but comes in a better name. Out of the mouth of the mother of God, more than the doors of doom, I call the muster of Wessex men, from grassy hamlet, or ditch, or den, to break and be broken, God knows when, but I have seen for whom. Out of the mouth of the mother of God, like a little word come I, for I go gathering Christian men, from sunken paving and ford and a fen, to die in a battle, God knows when, my God, but I know why. And this is the word of Mary, the word of the world's desire. No more of comfort shall ye get, save that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Then silence sank, and slowly arose the sea landlord, like some vast beast for mystery. He filled the room, and porch, and sky, and from a cobwebbed nail on high unhooked his heavy sword. Up on the shrill sea downs, and up, went Alfred, all alone, turning but once or the door was shut, shouting to Eldred o'er his butt, that he bring all spears to the woodman's hut, hewn under Edbert's stone. And he turned his back, and broke the fern, and fought the malls of dusk, and went on his way for other friends, friends, fallen of all the wide world's ends, from Rome that wrath and pardon sends, and the grey tribes on Usk. He saw gigantic tracks of death, and many a shape of doom, good steadings to grey ashes gone, and a monk's house, white like a skeleton, in the green crypt of the comb. And in many a Roman villa, earth and her ivies eat, saw coloured pavements, sink and fade, in flowers and the windy colonnade, like the spectre of a street. But the cold stars clustered among the cold pines, ere he was half on his pilgrimage over the western lines, and the white dawn widened ere he came to the last pine, where Mark, the man from Italy, still made the Christian sign. The long farm lay on the large hillside, flat like a painted plan, and by the side of the low white house where dwelt the Southland man. A bronze man, with a bird's bright eye, and a strong bird's beak and brow. His skin was brown like buried gold, and of certain of his sires was told, that they came in the shining ship of old, with Caesar in the prow. His fruit trees stood like soldiers, drilled in a straight line. His strange stiff olives did not fail, and all the kings of the earth drank ale, but he drank wine. Wide over wasted British plains stood never an arch or dome, only the trees to toss and reel, and the tribes to bicker, and the beasts to squeal, but the eyes in his head were strong like steel, and his soul remembered Rome. Then Alfred of the lonely spear lifted his lion's head, and fronted with the Italian's eye, 
asking him of his whence and why, King Alfred stood and said, I am that oft-defeated king whose failure fills the land, who fled before the Danes of old, who chaffered with the Danes with gold, who now upon the Wessex wold hardly has feet to stand, but out of the mouth of the mother of God I have seen the truth like fire. This, that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Long looked the Roman on the land, the trees as golden crowns, blazed, drenched with dawn, and dew impearled, while faintly are coloured, freshly are curled, the clouds from underneath the world stood up over the downs. These vines be ropes that drag me hard, he said. I go not far. Where would you meet? For you must hold half Wiltshire and the white horse wold, and the Thames bank to Owen's fold, if Wessex goes to war. Gertham sits strong on either bank, and you must press his lines. Inwards and eastward drive him down. I doubt if you shall take the crown till you have taken London town. For me, I have the vines. If each man on the judgment day meet God on a plain alone, said Alfred, I will speak for you as for myself and call it true, that you brought all fighting folk you knew lined under Edbert stone. Though I be in the dust ere then, I know where you will be. And shouldering suddenly his spear, he faded like some elf in fear, where the tall pines ran up, tier on tier, tree over toppling tree. He shouldered his spear at morning, and laughed to lay it on, but he leaned on his spear as on a staff, with might and little mood to laugh, or ever he sighted chick or calf of Colin of Carleon. For the man dwelt in a lost land of boulders and broken men, in a great cave far off to the south, where a thick green forest stopped the mouth, giving darkness in his den. And the man was come like a shadow, from the shadow of druid trees, where us with mighty murmurings past Carleon of the fallen kings goes out to the ghostly seas. Last of a race in ruin, he spoke the speech of the gales. His kin were in holy Ireland, or up in the crags of Wales. But his soul stood with his mother's folk, that were of the rain-wrapped isle, where Patrick and Brandon Westerly looked out at last on a landless sea and the sun's last smile. His harp was carved and cunning, as the Celtic craftsman makes, graven all over with twisting shapes like many headless snakes. His harp was carved and cunning, his sword was prompt and sharp, and he was gay when he held the sword and sad when he held the harp. For the great gales of Ireland are the men that God made mad, for all their wars are merry, and all their songs are sad. He kept the Roman order, he made the Christian sign, but his eyes grew often blind and bright, and the sea that rose in the rocks at night rose to his head like wine. He made the sign of the cross of God, he knew the Roman prayer, but he had unreason in his heart, because of the gods that were, even they that walked on the high cliffs, high as the clouds were then, gods of unbearable beauty, that broke the hearts of men, and whether in seat or saddle, whether with frown or smile, whether at feast or fight was he, he heard the noise of a nameless sea on an undiscovered isle. Lifting the great green ivy, and the great spear lowering, one said, I am Alfred of Wessex, and I am a conquered king. And the man of the cave made answer, and his eyes were stars of scorn, and better kings were conquered or ever your sires were born. What goddess was your mother, what fay your breed begot, that you should not die with Uther and Arthur and Lancelot? And when you win you brag and blow, and when you lose you rail, army of Eastland yokels not strong enough to fail. I bring not boast or railing, spake Alfred, not in ire. I bring of Our Lady a lesson set, this, that the sky grows darker yet, and the sea rises higher. Then Colin of the sacred tree tossed his black mane on high, and cried as rigidly he rose, And if the sea and sky be foes, we will tame the sea and sky. Smiled Alfred, seek ye a fable more dizzy and more dread than all your mad barbarian tales where the sky stands on its head, a tale where a man looks down on the sky, 
that has long looked down on him, a tale where a man can swallow a sea that might swallow the seraphim. Bring to the hut on Edbert stone all bills and bows ye have, and Alfred strode off rapidly, and Colin of the sacred tree went slowly to his cave. End of Book Two Recording by Gail Cato Book Three of The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three The Harp of Alfred. In a tree that yawned and twisted, the king's few goods were flung, a mass book, mildewed line by line, and weapons, and a skin of wine, and an old harp unstrung. By the yawning tree in the twilight, the king unbound his sword, severed the harp of all his goods, and there, in the cool and soundless woods, sounded a single chord. Then laughed, and watched the finches flash, the sullen flies in swarm, and went unarmed over the hills, with the harp upon his arm, until he came to the white horse vale, and saw across the plains, in the twilight, high and far and fell, like the fiery terraces of hell, the campfires of the Danes. The fires of the great army that was made of iron men, whose lights of sacrilege and scorn ran around England red as morn, fires over Glastonbury thorn, fires out on Elifen. And as he went by White Horse Vale, he saw lie, wan and wide, the old horse graven, God knows when, by gods or beasts or what kings, then walked a new world instead of men, and scrawled on the hillside. And when he came to the white horse down, the great white horse was grey, for it was ill, scoured of the weed, and lichen, and the thorn could crawl and feed, since the foes of settled house and creed had swept old works away. King Alfred gazed all sorrowful at thistle and mosses grey, then laughed and watched the finches flash, till the rally of Danes with shield and bill rolled drunk over the dome of the hill, and hearing of his harp and skill, they dragged him to their play, and as they went through the white green grass, they roared like the great green sea, but when they came to the red campfire, they were silent suddenly, and as they went up the wastes away, they went reeling to and fro, but when they came to the red campfire, they stood all in a row, for golden in the firelight, with a smile carved on his lips, and a beard curled right cunningly, was Girthram of the Northern Sea, the emperor of the ships. With three great earls King Girthram went round from fire to fire, with Harold, nephew of the king, and Agia of the stone and sling, and Elf, whose gold lute was a string that sighed like all desire. The earls of the great army, that no man born could tire, whose flames are near him or aloof, took hold of towers or walls or proof, fire over Glastonbury roof, and out on Ele, fire. And Guthrum heard the soldier's tale, and bade the stranger play, not harshly, but as one on high, on a marble pillar in the sky, who sees all folk that live and die, pygmy and far away. And Alfred, king of Wessex, looked on his conqueror, and his hands hardened, but he played, leaving all later hates unsaid, he sang of some old British raid on the wild west march of yore. He sang of war in the warm wet shires, where rain nor fruitage falls, where England of the motley states deepens like a garden to the gates in the purple walls of Wales. He sang of the seas of savage heads, and the seas and the seas of spears, boiling all over Offa's dyke, what time a Wessex club could strike the kings of the mountaineers, till a herald laughed and snatched the harp, the kinsman of the king, a big youth, beardless like a child, whom the new wine of war sent wild, smote and began to sing. And he cried of the ships of eagles that circle fiercely and fly and sweep the seas and strike the towns from Cyprus round to sky. How swiftly and with peril 
They gather all good things, the high horns of the forest beasts, or the secret stones of kings. For Rome was given to rule the world, and got of it little joy. But we, we shall enjoy the world, the whole huge world, a toy. Great wine, like blood from Burgundy, cloaks like clouds from Tyre, and marble like solid moonlight, and gold like frozen fire. Smells that a man might swill in a cup, stones that a man might eat, and the great smooth woman like ivory that the Turks sell in the street. He sang the song of the thief of the world, and the gods that love the thief, and he yelled aloud at the cloister yards, where men go gathering grief. Well, have you sung, O stranger, of death on the dyke in Wales? Your chief was a bracelet giver, but the red unbroken river of a race runs not for ever, but suddenly it fails. Doubtless your sires were sword swingers when they waded fresh from foam, before they were turned to women by the gods of the nails from Rome. But since you bent to the shaven head, who neither lust nor smite, thunder of Thor, we hunt you, a hare on the mountain height. King Guthrum smiled a little, and said, It is enough, nephew, let Elf retune the string. A boy must needs like bellowing, but the old ears of a careful king are glad of songs less rough. Blue-eyed was Elf the minstrel, with womanish hair and ring, yet heavy was his hand on sword, though light upon the string. And he stirred the strings of the harp, to notes but four or five, the heart of each man moved in him, like a babe buried alive, and they felt the land of the folk songs spread southward of the Dane, and they heard of the good Rhine following in the heart of all Alamein. They felt the land of the folk songs, where the gifts hang on the tree, where the girls give ale at morning, and the tears come easily. The mighty people, womanlike, they have pleasure in their pain. And he sang of Balda beautiful, whom the heavens loved in vain. As he sang of Balda beautiful, whom the heavens could not save, Till the world was like a sea of tears, and every soul a wave. There is always a thing forgotten, when all the world goes well, A thing forgotten as long ago, when the gods forgot the mistletoe, And soundless as an arrow of snow, the arrow of anguish fell. The thing on the blind side of the heart, on the wrong side of the door. The green plant groweth menacing, almighty lovers in the spring. There is always a forgotten thing, and love is not secure. And all that sat by the fire were sad, save Agya, who was stern, and his eyes hardened even to stones as he took the harp in turn. Earl Agya of the stone and sling was odd to ear and sight. Old he was, but his locks were red, and jests were all the words he said. Yet he was sad at board and bed, and savage in the fight. You sing of the young gods easily in the days when you are young, but I go smelling you and sods, and I know that there are gods behind the gods, gods that are best unsung. And a man grows ugly for woman, and a man grows dull with ale, well, if he finds in his soul at last fury that does not fail, the wrath of the gods behind the gods who would rend all gods and men, well, if the old man's heart hath still, wheels sped of rage and roaring, will, like cataracts, to break down and kill, well, for the old man, then, while there is one tall shrine to shake, or one live man to rend, for the wrath of the gods behind the gods, who are weary to make an end. There lives one moment for a man, when the door at his shoulder shakes, when the taut rope parts under the pole, and the barest branch is beautiful, one moment while it breaks. So rides my soul upon the sea that drinks the howling ships, though in the black jest it bows and nods under the moon with silver rods, I know it is roaring at the gods, waiting the last eclipse. And in the last eclipse the sea shall stand up like a tower, Above all moons, made dark and riven, Hold up its foaming head in heaven, And laugh, knowing its hour, And the high ones in the happy town, Propped of the planet seven, 
shall know a new light in the mind, a noise about them, and behind shall hear an awful voice, and find foam in all the courts of heaven. And you that sit by the fire are young, and true love waits for you, but the king and I grow old, grow old, and hate alone is true. And Guthrum shook his head, but smiled, for he was a mighty clerk, and had read lines in the Latin books when all the north was dark. He said, I am older than you, Agya, not all things would I rend, for whether life be bad or good, it is best to abide the end. He took the great harp wearily, even Guthrum of the Danes, with wide eyes bright as the one long day on the long polar plains. For he sang of a wheel returning, and the mire trod back to mire, and how red hells and golden heavens are castles in the fire. It is good to sit where the good tales go, to sit as our father sat, but the hour shall come after his youth, when a man shall not know tales but truth, and his heart fail thereat. When he shall read what is written, so plain in the clouds, and clods, when he shall hunger without hope, even for evil gods. For this is a heavy matter, and the truth is cold to tell. Do we not know, have we not heard, the soul is like a lost bird, the body a broken shell. And a man hopes, being ignorant, till in the white woods apart, he finds at last the lost bird dead, and a man lay, still, lift up his head, but never more his heart. There comes no noise but weeping, out of the ancient sky, and a tear is in the tiniest flower, because the gods must die. The little brooks are very sweet, like a girl's ribbons curled, but the great sea is bitter, that washes all the world. Strong are the Roman roses, or the free flowers of the hearth, but every flower, like a flower of the sea, smelleth with the salt of death. And the heart of the locked battle is the happiest place for men. When shrieking souls, as shafts go by, and many have died, and all may die, though this world be a mystery, death is most distant then. Death blazes bright above the cup, and clear above the crown, but in that dream of battle, we seem to tread it down. Wherefore, I am a great king, and waste the world in vain, because man hath not other power, save that in dealing death for dower, he may forget it for an hour, to remember it again. And slowly his hands, and thoughtfully, fell from the lifted lyre, and the owls moaned from the mighty trees, till Alfred caught it in his knees, and smote it as in ire. He heaved the head of the harp on high, and swept the framework barred, and his stroke had all the rattle and spark of horses flying hard. When God put man in the garden, he girt him with his sword, and sent him forth a free knight that might betray his lord. He brake him and betrayed him, and fast and far he fell, till you and I may stretch our necks and burn our beards in hell. But though I lie on the floor of the world with the seven sins for rods, I would rather fall with Adam than rise with all your gods. What have the strong gods given? Where have the glad gods led? When Guthrum sits on a hero's throne and asks if he is dead. Sirs, I am but a nameless man, a rhymester without home. Yet since I come of the Wessex clay and carry the cross of Rome, I will even answer when the mighty earl that asked of Wessex men why they be meek and monkish folk and bow to the white lord's broken yoke. What sign have we save blood and smoke? Here is my answer, then, that on you is fallen the shadow and not upon the name, that though we scatter and though we fly and you hang over us like the sky, you are more tired of victory than we are of shame that though you hunt the Christian men like a hare on the hillside, the hare has still more heart to run than you have heart to ride, that though all lances split on you, all swords be heaved in vain, we have more lust again to lose than you to win again. Your lord sits high in the saddle, a broken-hearted king, but our king Alfred, lost from fame, fallen among foes or bonds of shame, 
in I know not what mean trade or name, has still some song to sing. Our monks go robbed in rain and snow, but the heart of the flame therein. But you go clothed in feasts and flames, and all is ice within. Nor shall all iron dooms make dumb, men wandering ceaselessly, if it not be better to fast for joy than feast for misery. Nor monkish order only slides down as fields of fen, all things achieved and chosen pass, as the white horse fades in the grass, no work of Christian men. Ere the sad gods that made your gods saw their sad sunrise pass, the white horse of the white horse veil that you have left to darken and fail was cut out of the grass. Therefore your end is on you, is on you and your kings, not for a fire in L.A. Fen, not that your gods are nine or ten, but because it is only Christian men guard even heathen things. For our God hath blessed creation, calling it good. I know what spirit with whom you blindly band hath blessed destruction with his hand. Yet by God's death the star shall stand, and the small apples grow. And the king with harp on his shoulder stood up and ceased his song. And the owls moaned from the mighty trees, and the Danes laughed loud and long. End of book three. Recording by Gail Cato. Book four of the Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book four. The Woman in the Forest. Thick thunder and the snorting swine, enormous in the gloam, rending among all roots that cling, and the wild horses whinnying were the night's noises when the king, shouldering his harp, went home. With eyes of owl and feet of fox, full of all thoughts he went. He marked the tilt of the pagan camp, the paling of pine, the sentry's tramp, and the one great stolen altar lamp over Guthrum in his tent. By scrub and thorn in Ethendon that night the foe had lain, whence ran across the heather grey the old stones of a Roman way, and in a wood not far away the pale road split in twain. He marked the wood and the cloven ways with an old captain's eyes, and he thought how many a time had he sought to see doom he could not see, how ruin had come, and a victory, and both were a surprise. Even so he had watched and wondered under ash down from the plains, with Ethelred praying in his tent, till the white hawthorn swung and bent, as Alfred rushed his spears and rent the shield wall of the Danes. Even so he had watched and wondered, knowing neither less nor more, till all his lords lay dying, and axes on axes plying flung him and drove him flying like a pirate to the shore. Wise he had been before defeat, and wise before success, wise in both hours and ignorant, knowing neither more nor less. As he went down to the river hut, he knew a nightshade scent. Owls did as evil cherubs rise, with little wings and lantern eyes, as though he sank through the under skies, but down and down he went. As he went down to the river hut, he went as one that fell, seeing the high forest domes and spars, dim green or torn with golden scars, as the proud look up at the evil stars in the red heavens of hell. For he must meet by the river hut them he had bidden to arm, Mark from the towers of Italy, and Colin of the sacred tree, and Eldred who beside the sea held heavily his farm. The roof leaned gaping to the grass, as a monstrous mushroom lies, Echoing and empty seemed the place, but opened in a little space, and a great grey woman with scarred face and strong and humbled eyes. King Alfred was but a meagre man, bright-eyed, but lean and pale, and swordless with his harp and rags he seemed a beggar, such as lags, looking for crusts and ale. And the woman, with a woman's eyes of pity at once and ire, said that when she had glared a span, there is a cake for any man if he will watch the fire. And Alfred, bowing heavily, sat down the fire to stir, and even as the woman pitied him, so did he pity her. 
saying, O great heart in the night, O best cast forth for worst, twilight shall melt, and morning stir, and no kind thing shall come to her, till God shall turn the world over, and all the last are first. And well may God with the serving folk cast in his dreadful lot. Is not he too a servant, and is not he forgot? For was not God my gardener, and silent like a slave, that opened oaks in the uplands, or the thicket and graveyard gave? And was not God my armourer, all patient and unpaid, that sealed my skull as a helmet, and ribs for hauberk made? Did not a great grey servant of all my sires and me build this pavilion of the pines, and herd the fowl, and fill the vines, and labour, and pass, and leave no signs, save mercy and mystery? For God is a great servant, and rose before the day, from some primordial slumber torn, but all we living later born sleep on, and rise after the morn, and the Lord has gone away. On things half sprung from sleeping, all sleepy suns have shone. They stretch stiff arms the yawning trees, the beasts blink upon hands and knees, and man is awake and does and sees, but heaven has done and gone. For who shall guess the good riddle, or speak of the holiest, save in faint figures and failing words, who loves yet laughs among the swords, labours, and is at rest. But some see God like Guthrum, crowned, with a great beard curled. But I see God like a good giant, that labouring lifts the world. Wherefore was God in Golgotha, slain as a serf is slain, and hate he had of prince and peer, and love he had, and made good cheer, of them that like this woman here go powerfully in pain. But in this great morn of a man's life cometh some time to mind, a little light that leaps and flies, like a star blown on the wind, a star of nowhere, a nameless star, a light that spins and swirls, and cries that even in hedge and hill, even on earth it may go ill, at last with the evil earls. A dancing sparkle, a doubtful star, on the waste wind whirled and driven, but it seems to sing of a wilder worth, a time discrowned of doom and birth, and the kingdom of the poor on earth come as it is in heaven. But even though such days endure, how shall it profit her, who shall go groaning to the grave, with many a meek and mighty slave, field-breaker and fisher on the wave, woodman and wagoner? Bake ye the big world all again, a cake with kinder leaven. Yet these are sorry evermore, unless there be a little door, a little door in heaven. And as he wept for the woman, he let her business be. And like his royal oath and rash, the good food fell upon the ash, and blackened instantly. Screaming, the woman caught a cake yet burning from the bar, and struck him suddenly on the face, leaving a scarlet scar. King Alfred stood up, wordless, a man, dead with surprise, and torture stood, and the evil things that are in the childish hearts of kings an instant in his eyes and even as he stood and stared, drew round him from the dusk. Those friends creeping from far-off farms, Marcus with all his slaves in arms, and the strange spears hung with ancient charms of Colin of the Usk. With one whole farm marching afoot, the trampled road resounds, farmhands and farm beasts blundering by, and jars of mead and stores of rye, where Eldred strode above his high and thunder-throated hounds and grey cattle and silver load against the unlifted morn, and straw clung to the spear shafts tall, and a boy went before them all, blowing a ram's horn. As mocking such rude revelry, the dim clan of the gale came like a bad king's burial end, with dismal robes that drop and rend, and demon pipes that wail. In long outlandish garments, torn, though of antique worth, with druid beards and druid spears, as a resurrected race appears out of an elder earth. And though the king had called them forth and knew them for his own, so still each eye stood like a gem, so spectral hung each broidered hem. Grey carven men he fancied them hewn in an age of stone, and the two wild peoples of the north stood fronting in the gloam, and heard and knew each in its mind the third great thunder on the wind, the living walls that hedge mankind. 
the walking walls of Rome. Marched were the mixed tribes of the West, of many a hue and strain, girth with rank hair like yellow grass, and the Cornish fisher gorillas, and Helmer come from his first mass, lately baptized a Dane. But like one man in armor, those hundreds trod the field, from red Arabia to Tyne, the earth had heard that marching line, since the cry on the hill capital line, and the fall of the golden shield. And the earth shook, and the king stood still under the greenwood bough, and the smoking cake lay at his feet, and the blow was on his brow. Then Alfred laughed out suddenly, like thunder in the spring, till shook aloud the lintel beams, and the squirrels stirred in dusty dreams, and the startled birds went up in streams for the laughter of the king. And the beasts of the earth and the birds looked down in a wild solemnity, on a stranger sight than sylph or elf, on one man laughing at himself under the greenwood tree. The giant laughter of Christian men that roars through a thousand tales were greed as an ape and pride as an ass, and jacks away with his master's lass, and the misser is banged with all his brass, and the farmer with all his flails. Tales that tumble, and tales that trick, yet end not all in scorning, of kings and clowns in a merry flight, and the clock gone wrong, and the world gone right, and the mummers sing upon Christmas night, and Christmas day in the morning. Now here is a good warrant, cried Alfred, by my sword, for he that is struck for an ill servant should be a kind lord. He that has been a servant knows more than priests and kings, but he that has been an ill servant he knows all earthly things. Pride flings frail palaces at the sky, as a man flings up sand, but the firm feet of humility take hold of heavy land. Pride juggles with her toppling towers, they strike the sun and cease, but the firm feet of humility, they grip the ground like trees. He that hath failed in a little thing hath a sign upon his brow, and the earls of the great army have no such seal to show. The red print on my forehead, small flame for a red star, in the van of the violent marching, then, when the sky is torn and the trumpets ten, and the hands of the happy howling men fling wide the gates of war. This blow that I return not, ten times will I return, on kings and earls of all degree, and armies wide as empires be, shall slide like land ships to the sea, if the red star burn. One man shall drive a hundred as the dead kings drave, before me rocking hosts be riven, and battering cohorts backwards driven, for I am the first king known of heaven that has been struck like a slave. Up on the old white road, brothers, up on the Roman walls, for this is the night of the drawing of swords, and the tainted tower of the heathen hordes leans to our hammers, fires, and cords, leans a little, and falls. Follow the star that lives and leaps, follow the sword that sings, for we go gathering heathen men, a terrible harvest, ten by ten, as the wrath of the last red autumn, then when Christ reaps down the kings. Follow a light that leaps and spins, Follow the fire unfurled, for rise up against realm and rod, a thing forgotten, a thing downtrod, the last lost giant, even God is risen above the world. Roaring they went o'er the Roman wall, and roaring up the lane, their torches tossed a ladder of fire, higher their hymn was heard, and higher, more sweet for hate and for heart's desire, and up in the northern scrub and briar they fell upon the Dane. End of Book 4 Recording by Gail Cato Book 5 of The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 5 Ethendon, The First Stroke King Guthrum was a dread king, like a death out of the north, Shrines without name or number he rent and rolled as lumber. From Chester to the Humber he drove his foemen forth. The Roman villas heard him in the valley of the Thames, come over the hills roaring above their roofs, and pouring on spire and stair and flooring, brimstone and pitch and flames. 
Sheer o'er the great chalk uplands, and the hill of the horse went he, till high on Hampshire beacons he saw the southern sea. High on the heights of Wessex he saw the southern brine, and turned him to a conquered land, where the northward thornwoods stand, and the road parts on either hand there came to him a sign. King Guthrum was a war chief, a wise man in the field, and though he prospered well, and knew how Alfred's folk were sad and few, not less with weighty care he drew long lines for pike and shield. King Guthrum lay on the upper land, on a single road at gaze, and his foe must come with lean array up the left arm of the cloven way to the meeting of the ways, and long ere the noise of armour, an hour ere the break of light, the woods awoke with crash and cry, and the birds sprang clamouring harsh and high, and the rabbits ran like an elf's army ere Alfred came in sight. The live wood came at Guthrum, on foot and claw and wing, the nests were noisy overhead, for Alfred and the star of red all life went forth, and the forest fled before the face of the king. But halted in the woodways, Christ's few were grim and grey, and each with a small, far bird-like sight saw the high folly of the fight, and though strange joys had grown in the night, despair grew with the day. And when white dawn crawled through the wood like cold foam of a flood, then weakened every warrior's mood, in hope though not in hardihood, and each man sorrowed as he stood in the fashion of his blood. For the Saxon Franklin sorrowed for the things that had been fair, for the dear dead woman crimson clad, and the great feasts and the friends he had, but the Celtic prince's soul was sad for the things that never were. In the eyes Italian all things but a black laughter died, and Alfred flung his shield to earth, and smote his breast, and cried, I wronged a man to his slaying, and a woman to her shame, and once I looked on a sworn maid that was wed to the holy name, and once I took my neighbour's wife that was bound to an Eastland man, in the starkness of my evil youth before my griefs began. People, if you have any prayers, say prayers for me, and lay me under a Christian stone in that lost land I thought my own to wait till the holy horn is blown and all poor men are free. Then Eldred of the idle farm leaned on his heavy sword as fell with heavy words and few and his eyes were of such alien blue as gleams where the Northman saileth new into an unknown ford. I was a fool and wasted ale. My slaves found it sweet. I was a fool and wasted bread, and the birds had bread to eat. The kings go up, and the kings go down, and who knows who shall rule. Next night a king may starve or sleep, but men and birds and beasts shall weep at the burial of a fool. O oh, drunkards in my cellar, boys in my apple tree, the world grows stern and strange, and new and wise men shall govern you, and you shall weep for me. But yoke me my own oxen down to my own farm. My own dog will whine for me. My own friends will bend the knee, and the foes I slew openly have never wished me harm. And all were moved a little, but Colin stood apart, having first pity, and after, hearing like rat and rafter that little worm of laughter that eats the Irish heart. And his grey-green eyes were cruel, and the smile of his mouth waxed hard. And he said, And when did Britain become your burying yard? The tall trees of Britain we worshipped and were wise, but you shall raid the whole land through, and never a tree shall talk to you, though every leaf is a tongue taught true, and the forest is full of eyes. On one round hill to the seaward the trees grow tall and grey, and the trees talk together when all men are away. O'er a few round hills forgotten the trees grow tall in rings, and the trees talk together of many pagan things. Yet I could lie and listen with a cross upon my clay, and hear unhurt for ever what the trees of Britain say. A proud man was the Roman, his speech a single one, but his eyes were like an eagle's eyes that is staring at the sun. Dig for me where I die, he said, 
if first or last I fall, dead on the fell at the first charge, or dead by wantage wall. Lift not my head from bloody ground, bear not my body home, for all the earth is Roman earth, and I shall die in Rome. Then Alfred, king of England, bade blow the horns of war, and fling the golden dragon out, with crackle and acclaim and shout, scrolled and flame and far. And under the golden dragon went Wessex all along, past the sharp point of the cloven ways, out from the black wood into the blaze of sun and steel and song. And when they came to the open land they wheeled, deployed and stood. Midmost were Marcus and the king, and Eldred on the right hand wing, and leftwards Colin Darkling in the last shade of the wood. But the earls of the great army lay like a long half-moon, ten poles before their palisades, with wide-winged helms and runic blades, red giants of an age of raids in the thornland of Ethandun. Midmost the saddles rose and swayed, and a stir of horses' manes, where Guthrum and a few rode high, on horses, seized, in victory, but Agyo went on foot to die in the old way of the Danes. Far to the king's left, Elf the Bard led on the eastern wing, with songs and spells that changed the blood, and on the king's right Harold stood, the kinsman of the king. Young Harold, coarse with colours gay, smoking with oil and musk, and the pleasant voice of the young pushed through his people, giving tongue forwards, where grey as cobwebs hung the banners of the usk. But as he came before his line, a little space along, his beardless face broke into mirth, and he cried, What broken bits of earth are here? For what their clothes are worth I would sell them for a song. For Colin was hung with raiment, tattered like autumn leaves, and his men were all as thin as saints, and all as poor as thieves. No bows nor slings nor bolts they bore, but bills and pikes ill-made, and none but Colin bore a sword, and rusty was its blade. And Colin's eyes with mystery and iron laughter stirred, and he spoke aloud, but lightly, not labouring to be heard. Oh, truly we be broken hearts, for what cause it is said, we light our candles to that lord that broke himself for bread. But though we hold but bitterly what land the Saxon leaves, though Ireland be a land of saints and Wales a land of thieves, I say you yet shall weary of the working of your word, that stricken spirits never strike nor lean hands hold a sword. And if ever ye ride in Ireland, the jest may yet be said, there is the land of broken hearts and the land of broken heads. Not less barbarian laughter choked Harold like a flood, and shall I fight with scarecrows that am of Guthrum's blood? Meeting may be of war men where the best war man wins, but all this carry and a man shoots before the fight begins, and stopping in his onward strides he snatched a bow in scorn from some mean slave and bent it on Colin whose doom grew dark and shone stars evil over Carleon in the place where he was born. For Colin had not bow nor sling, on a lonely sword leaned he, like Arthur on Excalibur in the battle by the sea. To his great gold earring Harold tugged back the feathered tail, and swift had sprung the arrow, but swifter sprang the gale. Whirling the one sword round his head, a great wheel in the sun, he spent it, splendid through the sky, flying before the shaft could fly, it smote Earl Harold over the eye, and the blood began to run. Colin stood bare and weaponless, Earl Harold, as in pain, strove for a smile, put hand to head, stumbled, and suddenly fell dead, and the small white daisies all waxed red with the blood out of his brain and all at the marvel of the sword, cast like a stone to slay, cried out, said Alfred, who would see signs must give all things. Verily, man shall not taste of victory till he throws his sword away. Then Alfred, prince of England, and all the Christian earls, unhooked their swords and held them up, each offered to call in like a cup of chrysolite and pearls. And the king said, Do thou take my sword, who have done this deed of fire? For this is the manner of Christian men, 
whether of steel or priestly pen, that they cast their hearts out of their ken to get their heart's desire. And whether ye swear a hive of monks or one fair wife to friend, this is the manner of Christian men that their oath and yours they end. For love, our Lord, at the end of the world, sits a red horse like a throne, with a brazen helm and iron bow, but one arrow alone. Love with the shield of the broken heart, ever his bow doth bend, with a single shaft for a single prize, and the ultimate bolt that parts and flies comes with a thunder of split skies, and a sound of souls that rend. So shall you earn a king's sword who cast your sword away, and the king took with a random eye a rude axe from a hind hard by and turned him to the fray for the swords of the earls of daneland flamed round the fallen lord the first blood woke the trumpet tune as in a monk's rhyme a wizard's rune beginneth the battle of ethendon with the throwing of the sword end of book 5 recording by gail cato Book Six of the Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Six, The Slaying of the Chiefs. As the sea flooding the flat sands flew on the seaborne horde, the two hosts shocked with the dust and din, left of the Latin paladin, clanged all Prince Harold's howling kin on Colin and the sword. Crashed in the midst on Marcus, Agya with Guthrum by, and eastward of the central stir, far to the right and faintlier, the house of the elf the harp player struck Eldred's with a cry. The centre swat for weariness, stemming the screaming horde, and wearily went Colin's hands that swung King Alfred's sword. But east like a cloud of morning, to eastward easily, tall Eldred broke the sea of spears as a tall ship breaks the sea his face like a sanguine sunset, his shoulder a Wessex down, his hand like a windy hammer stroke, men could not count the crests he broke, so fast the crests went down. As the tall white devil of the plague moves out of Asian skies, with his foot in a waste of cities, and his head in a cloud of flies, or purple and peacock skies grow dark with a moving locust tower, or tawny sand winds tall and dry, like hell's red banners beat and fly, when death comes out of Arabi, was Eldred in his hour. But while he moved like a massacre, he murmured as in sleep, and his words were all of low hedges and little fields and sheep. Even as he strode like a pestilence that strides from Rhine to Rome, he thought how tall his beans might be, if ever he went home. Spoke some stiff piece of childish prayer, dull as the distant chimes, that thanked our God for good eating and corn and quiet times. Till on the helm of a high chief fell shatteringly his brand, and the helm broke, and the bone broke, and the sword broke in his hand. Then from the yelling northmen driven splintering, on him ran, full seven spears, and the seventh was never made by man. Seven spears, and the seventh was wrought as the fairy blades, and given to Elf the minstrel by the monstrous water-maids. By them that dwell where luridly lost waters of the Rhine Move among roots of nations being sunken for a sign. Under all graves they murmur, they murmur and rebel, Down to the buried kingdoms creep, And like a lost rain roar and weep o'er the red heavens of hell. Thrice drowned was Elf the minstrel, and washed as dead on sand, And the third time men found him the spear was in his hand. Seven spears went about Elfred like stays about a mast, but there was sorrow by the sea for the driving of the last. Six spears thrust upon Eldred were splintered while he laughed, one spear thrust into Eldred, three feet of blade and shaft. And from the great heart grievously came forth the shaft and blade, and he stood with the face of a dead man, stood a little, and swayed. Then fell as falls a battle tower, on smashed and struggling spears, cast down from some unconquered town, that rushing earthward carries down loads of live men of all renown, archers and engineers. And a great clamour of Christian men went up in agony, 
crying, Fallen is the tower of Wessex that stood beside the sea. Centre and right the Wessex guard grew pale for doubt and fear, and the flank failed at the advance, for the death light on the wizard lance, the star of the evil spear. Stand like an oak, cried Marcus, stand like a Roman wall. Eldred the good is fallen, are you too good to fall? When we were wan and bloodless, he gave you ale and now. The pirates deal with him as dung. God, are you bloodless now? Grip wolf and gorless, grip the ash. Slaves, and I make you free. Stamp Hildred hard in English land. Stand girth, stand gorless, Gowan stand. Hold Halfgar with the other hand. Halmar, hold up on knee. The lamps are dying in your homes. The fruits upon your bough, even now your old thatch smoulders, girth, now is the judgment of the earth, now is the death grip, now. For thunder of the captain, not less the Wessex line, leaned back and reeled a space to rear, as elf charged with the Rhine made spear and roaring like the Rhine. For the men were borne by the waving walls of woods and clouds that pass by dizzy plains and drifting sea, and they mixed God with glamoury, God with the gods of the burning tree, and the wizard's tower and glass. But Mark was come of the glittering towns where hot white details show, where men can number and expound, and his faith grew in a hard ground, of doubt and reason and falsehood found, where no faith else could grow. Belief that grew of all beliefs one moment back was blown, and belief that stood on unbelief stood up iron and alone. The Wessex crescent backwards, crushed as with bloody spear, went elf roaring and routing, and mark against elf, yet shouting, shocked in his mid-career. Right on the Roman shield and sword did spear of the Rhine maids run, but the shield shifted never, the sword rang down to sever, the great Rhine sang for ever, and the songs of elf were done and a great thunder of Christian men went up against the sky, saying, God hath broken the evil spear, ere the good man's blood was dry. Spears at the charge, yelled Mark amain, death on the gods of death, over the thrones of doom and blood, goeth God that is a craftsman good, and gold and iron, earth and wood, loveth and laboureth. The fruits leap up in all your farms, the lamps in each abode, God of all good things done on earth, all wheels or webs of any worth, the God that makes the roof girth, the God that makes the road, the God that heweth kings and oak, writeth songs on vellum, God of gold and flaming glass, Confrit Pontius, Arcam Suctum, Gaulus Gladium et Bellum. Steel and lightning broke about him, battle days and palm. All the sea kings, swayed among woods of the Wessex arms, upflung the trumpet of the Roman tongue, the thunder of the psalm. And midmost of that rolling field ran Ogyar ragingly, lashing at Mark who turned his blow, and brake the helm about his brow, and broke him to his knee. That Ogyar heaved over his head his huge round shield of proof, but Mark set one foot on the shield, one on some sundered rock upheeled, and towered above the tossing field, a statue on a roof. Dealing far blows about the fight, like thunderbolts a roam, like birds about the battlefield, while Agyar writhed under his shield, like a tortoise in his dome. But hate in the buried Agyar was strong as pain in hell, with a bare brute hand from the inside, he burst the shield of brass and hide, and a death stroke to the Roman side, sent suddenly and well. Then the great statue on the shield looked his last look around, with level and imperial eye, and Mark the man from Italy fell in the sea of agony and died without a sound. And Agia leaping up alive hurled his huge shield away, flying as when a juggler flings a whistling plate in play, and held two arms up rigidly and roared to all the Danes, Fallen is Rome, yea, fallen the city of the plains. Shall no more, born, remember that breaketh wood or wheel, how long she stood on the roof of the world as he stood upon my shield. The new wild world forgetteth her as foam fades on the sea, how long she stood with her foot on a man as he with his foot on me. 
no more shall the brown men of the south move like the ants in lines to quiet men with olives or maddened men with vines no more shall the white towns of the south where tibar and nihilus run sitting around a secret sea worship a secret sun the blind gods roar for rome fallen and forum and garland gone for the ice of the north is broken and the sea of the north comes on the blind gods roar and rave and dream for all cities under the sea for the heart of the north is broken and the blood of the north is free down from the dome of the world we come rivers on rivers down under us swirl the sects and hordes and the high dooms we drown down from the dome of the world and down struck flying as a skiff on the river in spate is spun and swirled until we come to the end of the world that breaks short like a cliff and when we come to the end of the world for me i count it fit to take the leap like a good river shot shrieking over it but what so hap at the end of the world where nothing is struck and sounds it is not by thor these monkish men these humbled wessex hounds not this pale line of christian hinds this one white string of men shall keep us back from the end of the world and the things that happened then it is not alfred's dwarfish sword nor egbert's pygmy crown shall stay us now that descend in thunder rending the realms and the realms thereunder down through the world and down there was that in the wild man back of him there was that in his own wild song a dizzy throbbing a drunkard's smoke that dazed to death all Wessex folk, and swept their spears along. Vainly the sword of Colin and the axe of Alfred plied, the Danes poured in like a brainless plague, and knew not when they died. Prince Colin slew a score of them, and was stricken to his knee. King Alfred slew a score and seven, and was borne back on a tree, back to the black gate of the woods, back up the single way back by the place of the parting ways christ's knights were whirled away and when they came to the parting ways doom's heaviest hammer fell for the king was beaten blind at bay down the right line with his array but colin swept the other way where he smote great strokes and fell the thorn woods over ethendon stand sharp and thick as spears by night in furs and forest harms far sundered with a friends in arms and loud lost blows the last alarms came not to alfred's ears the thornwoods over ethendun stand stiff as spikes in mail as to the hot king came at morn dead rolling on a doubtful horn seemed unto alfred lightly borne the last cry of the gale end of book six recording by gail cato Book Seven of the Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Seven, Ethendon, the Last Charge. Away in the waste of White Horse Down, an idle child alone, played some small game through hours that pass, and patiently would pluck the grass, patiently push the stone, on the lean green edge for ever, where the blank chalk touched the turf. The child played on, alone, divine, as a child plays on the last line that sunders sand and surf. For he dwelleth in high divisions, too simple to understand. Seeing on what morn of mystery the uncreated rent the sea with roarings from the land, through the long infant hours like days he built one tower in vain, piled up small stones to make a town, and evermore the stones fell down and he piled them up again and crimson kings on battle-towers and saints on gothic spires and hermits on their peaks of snow and heroes on their pyres and patriots riding royally that rush the rocking town stretch hands in hunger and aspire seeking to mount where high and higher the child whom time can never tire sings over white horse down and this was the night of alfred at the ending of the way that of such smiters wise or wild he was least distant from the child piling the stones all day for eldred fought like a frank hunter that killeth and goeth home 
and Mark had fought because all names rang like the name of Rome. And Colin fought with a double mind, moody and madly gay, but Alfred fought as gravely as a good child at play. He saw wheels break and work run back and all things as they were, and his heart was orbed like victory and simple like despair. Therefore is Mark forgotten, that was wise with his tongue and brave, and the Karen over Colin crumbled, and the cross on Eldred's grave. Their wind souls went on wind away, and they had not tail or tomb. And Alfred, born in wantage, rules England to the doom. Because in the forest of all fears, like a strange fresh gust from sea, struck him that ancient innocence, which is more than mastery. And as a child whose bricks fall down, repiles them o'er and o'er, came ruin and the rain that burns, returning as the wheel returns, and crouching in the firs and ferns he began his life once more. He took his ivory horn, unslung, and smiled but not in scorn. Endeth the battle of Ethendun with the blowing of a horn. On a dark horse at a double way he saw Guthrum ride, heard roar of brass and ring of steel, the laughter and the trumpet peal, the pagan in his pride. And Ogyar's red and hated head moved in some talk or task, but the men seemed scattered in the briar, and some of them had lit a fire, and one had broached a cask. And wagons one or two stood up like tall ships in sight, as if an outpost were encamped at the cloven ways for night. And joyous of the sudden stay, of Alfred's routed few, sat one upon a stone to sigh, and some slipped up the road to fly, till Alfred in the fern hard by set horn to mouth and blew. And they all abode like statues, one sitting on the stone, one halfway through the horn hedge tall, one with a leg across a wall, and one looked backwards very small, far up the road, alone. Grey twilight and a yellow star hung over thorn and hill, two spears and a cloven war-shield lay, Loose on the road as cast away, The horn died faint in the forest grey, And the fleeing men stood still. Brothers at arms, said Alfred, On this side lies the foe, Our slavery and starvation flowers, That you should pluck them so? For whether it is better to be prodded with Danish poles, Having hewn a chamber in a ditch, And sounded like a howling witch, Or smoked to death in holes? Or that before the red cock crow, all we, a thousand strong, go down the dark road to God's house singing a Wessex song. To sweat a slave, to a race of slaves, to drink up infamy? No, brothers, by your leave I think death is a better ale to drink, and by all the stars of Christ that sink the Dane shall drink with me. To grow old cowed in a conquered land, with the sun itself discrowned, to see trees crouch and cattle slink, death is a better ale to drink. And by high death on the fell brink, that flagon shall go down. Through death are all the paladins whom glory had in ken. Though all your thunder sworded thanes with proud hearts died among the Danes, while a man remains, great war remains. Now is a war of men, the men that tear the furrows, the men that fell the trees, when all their lords be lost and dead. The bondsmen of the earth shall tread the tyrants of the seas. The wheel of the roaring stillness of all labors under the sun speed the wild work as well at least as the whole world's work is done. Let Hildred hack the shield wall, clean as he hacks the hedge. Let Gurth the fowler stand as cool as he stands on the chasm's edge. Let Gorlis ride the sea kings as Gorlis rides the sea. Then let all hell and Denmark drive, yelling to all its fiends alive, and not a rag care we. When Alfred's word was ended, stood firm that feeble line, each in his place with club or spear, and fury deeper than deep fear, and smiles as sour as brine. And the king held up the horn and said, See ye my father's horn, that Egbert blew in his empery once when he rode out commonly, twice when he rode for venery, and thrice on the battle-morn. 
but heavier fates have fallen the horn of the wessex kings and i blew once the riding sign to call you to the fighting line and glory and all good things and now two blasts the hunting sign because we turn to bay but i will not blow the three blasts till we be lost or they and now i blow the hunting sign charge some by rule and rod but when i blow the battle sign charge all and go to god wild stared the danes at the double way where they loitered all at large as that dark line for the last time doubled the knee to charge and caught their weapons clumsily and marvelled how and why in such degree by rule and rod the people of the peace of god went roaring down to die and when the last arrow was fitted and was flown when the broken shield hung on the breast and the hopeless lance was laid to rest and the hopeless horn was blown the king looked up and what he saw was a great light like death for our lady stood on the standards rent as lonely and as innocent as when between white walls she went and the lilies of nazareth one instant in a still light he saw our lady then her dress was soft as western sky and she was a queen most womanly but she was a queen of men over the iron forest he saw our lady stand her eyes were sad without an art and seven swords were in her heart but one was in her hand then the last charge went blindly and all too lost for fear the danes closed round a roaring ring and twenty clubs rose o'er the king four danes hewed at him hallowing and augiar of the stone and sling drove at him with a spear but the danes were wild with laughter and the great spear spung wide the point stuck to a straggling tree and either host cried suddenly as alfred leapt aside short time had shaggy augiar to pull his lance in line he knew king alfred's axe on high he heard it rushing through the sky he cowered beneath it with a cry it split him to the spine and alfred sprang over him dead and blew the battle sign then bursting all and blasting came christendom like death kicked of such catapults of will that staves shiver and barrels spill the wagons waver and crash and kill the wagoners beneath barriers go backwards banners rend great shields groan like a gong horses like horns of nightmare neigh horribly and long horses ramp high and rock and boil and break their golden reins and slide on carnage clamorously down where the bitter blood doth lie where augia went on foot to die in the old way of the danes the high tide king alfred cried the high tide and the turn as the tide turns on the tall gray seas see how they waver in the trees how stray their spears how knock their knees how wild their watch-fires burn the mother of god goes over them walking on wind and flame and the storm cloud drifts from city and dale and the white horse stamps in the white horse vale and we all shall yet drink christian ale in the village of our name the mother of god goes over them on dreadful cherubs born and the psalm is roaring above the rune and the cross goes over the sun and moon endeth the battle of ethandune with the blowing of a horn for back indeed disorderly the danes went clamouring too worn to take anew the tale or dazed with insolence and ale or stunned of heaven or stricken pale before the face of the king for dire was alfred in his hour his pale scribe witnesseth more mighty in defeat was he than all men else in victory and behind his men came murderously dry-throated drinking death and edgar of the golden ship he slew with his own hand took ludwig from his lady's bower and smote down harmer in his hour and vain and lonely stood the tower the tower in gilderland and tore out of his tiny boat whose eyes beheld the nile wolf with his war-cry on his lips and harker born in the eclipse who blocked the scene with battleships round paris on the isle and hakon of the harvest song and dirk from eld he slew and kunt that melted durham bell and folk the fiery oscar fell and godric and sigel and urel of the yew 
and higher sang the slaughter, and fastest fell the slain, when from the wood road's blackening throat a crowning and crashing wonder smote the rear guard of the Dane. For the dregs of Colin's company lost down the other road, had gathered and grown and heard the din and with wild yells came pouring in, naked as their old British kin, and bright with blood for woad. And bare and bloody and aloft they bore before their hand the body of the mighty lord, Colin of Carleon, and its hoard that bore King Alfred's battle-sword, broken in his left hand. And a strange music went with him, loud and yet strangely far, the wild pipes of the western land, too keen for ear to understand, sang high and deathly on each hand when the dead men went to war. Blocked between ghost and buccaneer, brave men had dropped and died, and the wild sea lords well might quail as the ghastly war pipes of the gale called to the horns of White Horse Vale, and all the horns replied. And Hildred the poor hedger cut down four captains dead and Halmar laid three others low, and the great earls wavered to and fro for the living and the dead. And Gorlis grasped the great flag, the raven of Odin torn, and the eyes of Guthrum altered for the first time since morn. As a turn of the wheel of tempest tilts up the whole sky tall, and cliffs of wan cloud luminous lean out like great walls over us as if the heavens might fall. And such a tall and tilted sky sends certain snow or light, so did the eyes of Guthrum change, and the turn was more certain and more strange than a thousand men in flight. For not till the floor of the skies is spilt, or the stars look up through the rent earth sneeze, cometh such rending of certainties, as when one wise man truly sees what is more wise than he. He set his horse in the battle breach, even Guthrum of the Dane, and as ever had fallen, fell his brand, a falling tower or many a land, but Gurth the Fowler laid one hand upon his bridal rein. King Guthrum was a great lord, and higher than his gods. He put the popes to laughter, he chide the saints with rods, he took this hollow world of ours for a cup to hold his wine. In the parting of the woodways there came to him a sign. In Wessex in the forest, in the breaking of the spears, we set a sign on Guthrum to blaze a thousand years. Where the high saddles jostle, and the horse-tails toss, where the rose to the birds flying, a roar of deer undying, in deafness and strong crying, we signed him with the cross. Far out to the winding river the blood ran down for days, when we put the cross on Guthrum in the parting of the ways. End of Book 7 Recording by Gail Cato Book 8 of The Ballad of the White Horse by G. K. Chesterton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 8 The Scoring of the Horse In the years of the peace of Wessex, when the good king sat at home, Years following on that bloody boon, When she that stands above the moon Stood above death at Ethendun And saw his kingdom come. When the pagan people of the seas Fled to their palisades, Nailed there with javelins to cling, And wonder smote the pirate king, And brought him to his christening At the end of all his raids. For not till the night's blue slate Is wiped of its last star utterly, And fierce new signs writ there to read, Shall eyes with such amazement heed, As when a great man knows indeed a greater thing than he. And there came to his chrism loosing, Lord of all lands afar, And a line was drawn northwesterly That set King Edbert's empire free, Giving all lands by the northern sea To the sons of the northern star. In the days of the rest of Alfred, When all these things were done, and Wessex lay in a patch of peace like a dog in a patch of sun. The king sat in his orchard among apples green and red, with a little book in his bosom and the sunshine on his head, and he gathered the songs of simple men that swing with helm and hod, 
and the alms he gave as a Christian, like a river, alive with fishes ran, and he made gifts to a beggar man as to a wandering god. And he gat good laws of the ancient kings, like treasure out of the tombs, and many a thief in thorny nook, or a noble in sea-stained turret shook, for the opening of his iron book, and the gathering of the dooms. Then men would come from the ends of the earth, whom the king sat welcoming, and men would go to the ends of the earth because of the words of the king. For folk came into Alfred's face, whose javelins had been hurled on monsters that make boil the sea, kraken and coils of mystery, or thrust in ancient snows that be the white hair of the world. And some had knocked at the northern gates of the ultimate icy floor, where the fishes freeze and the foam turns black, and the wide world narrows to a track, and the other sea, at the world's back, cries through a closed door. And men went forth from Alfred's face, even great gift-bearing lords, not to roam only, but more bold, out to the high hot courts of old, of negroes clad in cloth of gold, silence and crooked swords. Scrawled screens and secret gardens and insect-laden skies, where fiery plains stretch on and on to the purple country of Prester John and the walls of Paradise. And he knew the might of the terre majeure, where kings began to reign, where in a night rout without name of gloomy Goths and Gauls there came, white above candles all aflame like a vision Charlemagne. And men seeking such embassy spake with the king and said, the steel that sang so sweet a tune, on Ashdown and on Ethendon, why hangs it scabbarded so soon, all heavily like lead? Why dwell the Danes in North England, and up to the river ride? Three more such marches like thine own would end them, and the pick should own, our sway and our feet climb the throne in the mountains of Strathclyde. And Alfred in the orchard, among apples green and red, with a little book in his bosom, looked at green leaves and said, when all philosophies shall fail, this world alone shall fit, that a sage feels too small for life and a fool too large for it. Asia and all imperial plains are too little for a fool, but for one man whose eyes can see, in the little island of Attlney it is too large a land to rule. Haply it had been better when I built my fortress there. Out in the reedy waters wide, I have stood on my mud wall and cried, Take England all from tide to tide, be Attlney my share. Those madmen of the throne scramble, oppressors and oppressed, had lined the banks of Attlney and waved and wailed unceasingly, where the river turned to the broad sea by an island of the blessed, and island like a little book full of a hundred tales, like the gilt page the good monk's pen, that is all smaller than a wren, yet hath high towers, meteors, and men, and suns, and spouting whales. A land having a light on it, in the river dark and fast, an isle with utter clearness lit, because a saint had stood in it, where flowers are flowers indeed, and fit, and trees are trees at last. So were the island of the saint, but I am a common king, and I will make my fences tough from Wantage Town to Plymouth Bluff, because I am not wise enough to rule so small a thing. And it fell in the days of Alfred, in the days of his repose, that his old customs in his sight were a straight road and a steady light. He bade them keep the white horse white as the first plume of the snows. And right to the red torchlight from the trouble of morning grey, they stripped the white horse of the grass, as they strip it to this day. And under the red torchlight he went dreaming as though dull, of his old companions slain like kings, and the rich, irrevocable things of a heart that hath not openings, but is shut fast, being full. And the torchlight touched the pale hair where silver clouded gold, and the frame of his face was made of cords, and a young lord turned among the lords, and said, The king is old. And even as he said it, a post ran in amain, crying, Arm, Lord King, the hamlet's arm, in the horror and the shade of harm. They have burnt Brand of Anger's farm, the Danes are come again. Danes drive the white east angles in six fights on the plains. Danes waste the world about the Thames, Danes to the eastward, Danes. And as he stumbled on one knee, the thanes broke out in ire, crying, All the watchmen watch, and all the sheriffs keep the shire. But the young earl said, All the saints, the saints of England guard, the land wherein we pledge them gold, the dykes decay, 
the king grows old, and surely this is hard, that we be never quit of them, that when his head is hoar, he cannot say to them he smoked, and spared with a hand, hard at the throat, go, and return no more. Then Alfred smiled, and the smile of him was like the sun for power, but he only pointed, bade them heed, those peasants of the Berkshire breed, who plucked the old horse of the weed as they pluck it to this hour. Will ye part with the weeds for ever, or show daisies to the door, or will you bid the bold grass go and return no more? So ceaseless and so secret thrive terror and theft set free. Treason and shame shall come to pass, while one weed flowers in a morass, and like the stillness of stiff grass, the stillness of tyranny. Over our white souls also, wild heresies are high, wave prouder than the plumes of grass, and sadder than their sigh. And I go riding against the raid, and ye know not where I am, but ye shall know, in a day or a year, when one green star of grass grows here, chaos has charged you, charger and spear, battle-axe and battering-ram. And though the skies alter, and empires melt, this world shall still be true. If ye would have the horse of old, scour ye the horse anew. One time I followed a dancing star that seemed to sing and nod, and ring upon earth all evil's knell. But now I wot, if ye scour not well, red rust shall grow on God's great bell, and grass in the streets of God. Ceased Alfred, and above his head the grand green domes, the downs, showed the first legions of the press, marching in haste and bitterness, for Christ's sake and the crowns. Beyond the cavern of Colin, past Eldrin's by the sea, rose men that owned King Alfred's rod from the windy wastes of Ex untrod, or where the thorn of the grave of God burns over Glastonbury. Far northward and far westward the distant tribes drew nigh. Plains beyond plains, fell beyond fell, that a man at sunset sees so well, and the tiny coloured towns that dwell in the corners of the sky. But dark and thick as thronged the host, with drum and torch and blade, that still-eyed king sat pondering, as one that watches a live thing, the scoured chalk, and he said, Though I give this land to Our Lady that helped me in Atelnay, Though lordlier trees and lustier sod, and happier hills hath no flesh trod than the garden of the mother of God between the Thames side and the sea. I know that weeds shall grow in it, faster than men can burn, and though they scatter now and go, in some far century, sad and slow, I have a vision, and I know the heathen shall return. They shall not come with warships, they shall not waste with brands, but in books, be all their eating, and ink be on their hands, not with the humour of hunters or savage skill in war, but ordering all things with dead words, strings shall they make of beasts and birds and wheels of wind and star. They shall come mild as monkish clerks with many a scroll and pen, and backward shall ye turn and gaze, desiring one of Alfred's days when pagans still were men. The dear son dwarfed of dreadful suns like fiercer flowers on stalk, earth lost and little like a pea in high heaven's towering forestry. These be the small weeds ye shall see crawl covering the chalk. But though they bridge St. Mary's sea or steal St. Michael's wing, though they rear marvels over us, greater than great Vergilus wrought for the Roman king, by this sign you shall know them, the breaking of the sword, a man no more a free knight that loves or hates his lord. Yea, this shall be the sign of them, the sign of the dying fire, and a man made like a half-wit that knows not of his sire. What though they come with scroll and pen, and grave as a shaven clerk, by this sign you shall know them, that they ruin and make dark, by all men bound to nothing, being slaves without a lord by one blind idiot, world obeyed, too blind to be abhorred, by terror and the cruel tales of curse in bone and kin, by weird and weakness winning, accursed from the beginning, by detail of the sinning and denial of the sin, by thought a crawling ruin, by life a leaping mire, 
by a broken heart in the breast of the world and the end of the world's desire by god and man dishonoured by death and life made vain know ye the old barbarian the barbarian come again when is great talk of trend and tide and wisdom and destiny hail that undying heathen that is sadder than the sea in what wise men shall smite him or the cross stand up again or charity or chivalry my vision saith not and i see no more but now ride doubtfully to the battle of the plain and the grass edge of the great down was cut clean as a lawn while the levies thronged from near and far from the warm woods of the western star and the king went out to his last war on a tall grey horse at dawn and the news of his far-off fighting came slowly and brokenly from the land of the east saxons from the sunrise and the sea from the plains of the white sunrise and sad st edmund's crown where the pools of essex pale and gleam out beyond london town in mighty and doubtful fragments like faint or fabled wars climb the old hills of his renown where the bold brow of the white horse down is close to the cold stars but away in the eastern places the wind of death walked high and a raid was driven athwart the raid the sky reddened and the smoke swayed and the tall grey horse went by the gates of the great river were breached as with a barge the walls sank crowded say the scribes and high towers populous with tribes seemed leaning from the charge smoke like rebellious heavens rolled curled over coloured flames mirrored in monstrous purple dreams in the mighty pool of thames loud was the war on london wall and loud in london gates and loud the sea kings in the cloud broke through their dreaming gods and loud cried on their dreadful fates and all the while on white horse hill the horse lay long and wan the turf crawled and the fungus crept and the little sorrel while all men slept unwrought the work of man with velvet finger velvet foot the fierce soft mosses then crept on the large white common wheel all folk had striven to strip and peel and the grass like a great green witch's wheel unwound the toils of men and clover and silent thistle throve and buds burst silently with little care for the thames valley or what things there might be that away on the winding river in the eastern plains for crowns stood up in the pale purple sky one turret of smoke like ivory and the smoke changed and the wind went by and the king took london town end of book 8 recording by gail cato end of the ballad of the white horse by g k chesterton